So welcome everyone. This is the second session of MLP NEAT, paper reading and discussion. Oh yeah, as I've mentioned, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to present the paper Deep Lab Semantic Image Segmentation with uh, Deep Convolution Nets, a true Convolution and Fully Connected CRFs. The method introduced in this paper is also known as Deep Lab B2. And as you can guess by the name, um, Dibla V2 is a family of architectures. Uh, the first one was, I think, uh, uh, right, uh, presented in a conference. And the second one basically uh, contains the key components to understand all the different architectures of Dibla, right? So uh, Dibla V3 is just a bit more incremental. Uh, B3 plus is even a bit more incremental. But as I've said, uh, once you understand Deep Lab V2, I think you can easily read the other papers and uh, they are very easy to understand, right? So because of this reason, uh, we decided to, to, yeah, to present this paper. Um, Deep Lab V2 tackles three problems. Uh, the first one is the reduced feature resolution. In machine learning, uh, typically, you want to transform the input data and reduce the dimensionality so that the model can learn something useful, right? And then, of course, in convolutional neural networks, you do the same. So what it is typically done in classification or segmentation is that you have your image, then you downsample it, uh, you perform a convolution, and then you get uh, another f uh, feature map from it, right? Um, I wrote here, well, I put here two images of the typical ways to reduce the dimensionality in images. One of them is max pooling. Uh, this is just a reminder. So if we have a max pooling with a window size, uh, window size two by two, we will just take uh, the yeah, two by two window size and then take the maximum value, right? So you can see here 20, then we get 20. In here we get 30 and so on. And the other way is uh, when you are doing conv the convolutional operation, uh, typically by default, you uh, shift the pixels uh, or the kernel, you shift it by one pixel at a time. But if you set strides equals two, you uh, move it two pixels at a time. And then as a result, you reduce the dimensionality of the input by half. Right, so these are the two typical ways to reduce the dimensionality of the data in images. And um, this figure, by the way, below is from the paper. And on the top, you can see the typical pipeline. So you have the image or the input data. Uh, you downsample it with either the strice equals two or with max pooling. Then you perform a convolution, then you get the feature maps and Typically in classification, you would just go uh, smaller and smaller, but in segmentation, at some point we have to upsample this because we want to classify each pixel of the image, right? And one way to do it is with uh, upsampling with, uh, for example, uh, bilinear interpolation. Bilinear interpolation is basically what you do when you take an image in paint and then you resize it. You just grab it here from the corner and then you resize it. So it's very typical. Um, and actually one thing I didn't like from this figure is that if you do, if you do bilinear interpolation, you actually don't get uh, a figure like this, uh, right? You will just resize this. I think in here authors, they just put a zero in between the, um, basically in the locations where there is no information. That's why it looks kind of sparse. But yeah, the way that they propose is to use a true convolution. And then this way we can just take the image directly, perform a convolution, and then we get this uh, feature map, which is uh, supposedly is high resolution. But since I was not too happy with this figure, I actually did this myself. And this is going to be part of the code that I'm going to show later. So I took one image and then I did both things. The typical way, which is here in the uh, right side, regular convolution, and also with a truth convolution. And I'm not sure if you can see it uh, because of the connection, but you can see that the um, the lines here in the bottom of the image, they are more well-defined 
than in the regular convolution. So yes, it is actually true that you get a higher resolution uh, feature map. Also in this area over here, you can see that in here is less blurry than in here. But yeah, it's, it's actually, it's not that different. That's why I didn't like this too much because you can see these two images are very different. But when you do this in practice, they are not that different. Although you can see that, again, that a true convolution is, provides more higher resolution. The second problem that they tackle in Deep Love V2 is the existence of multiple scale objects. And this is quite common in, in data sets, right? Especially, well, in ImageNet or in, in basically in all data sets. Uh, you want to be able to classify or to segment this object, which in this case is a cat, regardless of whether the cat is very big in the image or if it's very small or if it's like here in front, so it's super big. So you want to be able to do that, right? So you have objects from the same class, but they have different size. And then you need a different field of view. I will later explain more in detail what is the field of view, but uh, yes, so this is one of the problems. The third problem is the reduced accuracy, especially in borders. And this is something that uh, surprises me actually when I look at this paper because the output of the neural network is quite different from the ground truth. You can see that in the output of the neural network, all the details of this plane are basically lost. And that's why yeah, they do later the post-processing operation, but it surprises me every time. And this is um, again because of the uh, because of the downsampling operations, the max pooling and the strice equals two. In classification, uh, this is very useful because it is used to achieve invariance. For example, in this image over here, we have a mind, and we want to be able to classify it uh, regardless of its location, whether it's here or here or on, on the front. So when we downsample the, um, the image, uh, well, we can do this because we don't care too much about the location, but in segmentation, it is very important to somehow preserve the spatial information because we need to classify each individual pixel of the image. That's why I think segmentation is a bit more tricky than, than classification. And uh, yeah, so these were the three problems. And for these problems, Dibla V2 proposes three solutions or three methods. The first one is a true convolutions or delayed convolution is the same. I prefer to use delayed convolution because it's an English word, so it's easier to pronounce. Then they also propose the use of uh, a true spatial parameter pooling or ASPP. This is just a module. And then the third, thing they um, propose is to use conditional random fields or CRFs. And I will actually go into details in these three uh, methods. But before that, this is the general pipeline of the method, right? So you have the input, you have your convolutional neural network. And in here, you can just use any. I think in the paper, they use ResNet and VGG. Then on top of the network, you have the ASPP module, which would be here. And then as a result, you get this uh, score map. Um, I typically call this softmax probabilistic uh, map or values. I, I think you can call this in many ways. But yeah, uh, this is eight times uh, smaller than, than the input. So what they do is they do a bilinear interpolation. As I said, they resize it basically. And, and actually funny thing, as I've mentioned before, uh, right in the first image, you could see that they also do um, upsampling, I guess with interpolation and the image, the image before they look very different. You could see the holes, but in here, you can see that the, the images are very similar, which makes sense, right? And yeah, so after the bilinear interpolation, they use uh, fully connected CRFs as a post-processing operation, and then they get the final output. And again, this really surprises me uh, to see how different is the output of the network from the actual output or, or from the actual ground truth, actually. So it relies a lot on this conditional random fields, I think. So I'm gonna uh, talk about these methods a little bit more in detail. <clears throat> the first one, delayed convolution is 
basically this, I think this is one of these cases in which it's easier to understand something if you just look at the image than uh, explain it with words, but uh, I'm gonna try. So in this image over here in the right side, we have a regular convolution, right? So you can see this is the image. Uh, then you take a patch that is three by three, then you multiply it with a kernel size with, with a kernel or filter, which is three by three. And then you get one output out of it. But when you use delayed convolutions, uh, you are kind of delating right, the, um, the samples you get from the image. So instead of getting a three by three, well, you still get a three by three, but the, the pixels of the image that you get are more sparse. Right? They are equally sparse uh, in this way. Basically they put like zeros in between, right? So this area over here is not uh, counted. And this is this basically uh, increases the field of view, right? And now I'm gonna have I'm gonna just quickly remind what this uh, field of view, and just a little bit sorry for this image here. I just did it in paint very fast, so but I think it illustrates my point anyway, right? So when we have a three by three convolution, our field of view is three. Why? Uh, imagine this is your image over here, and this is the probabilistic map. So the one in the right is the probabilistic map, and the one in the left is your image. If you go to your probabilistic map and you just look at this green pixel over here, and you think uh, which pixels influence this uh, this pixel over here, right? So the ones that influence these pixels were the ones uh, marked here in red, right? Um, and this window size is three by three. Therefore, our, cur our field of view is three by three. In other words, uh, for each pixel in the output, there were th a window size of three by three pixels that influenced that pixel that we are producing. <coughs> and uh, typically it's very important to increase the field of view because we want to capture a larger context of the image. If we want to classify uh, images or segment uh, objects that are very large, you need a larger field of view to capture a larger context. And typically what it is done to increase the field of view is to, well, you can do two things. One thing is to, uh, instead of using a kernel of three by three, you just use a five by five or seven by seven, then you increase the field of view. But what typically, what is typically done nowadays, I think is to stack more three by three convolutions. So if we stack another one, our field of view becomes five. So uh, if we kind of illustrate that, it means that to get this uh, green pixel over here, uh, we use the values uh, in red. And to get these values in red, we use the values here in blue. And these values, uh, it's a window size of uh, five by five, basically. So that is why the field of view is uh, five. <coughs> So the cool thing of the related convolutions is that you can adjust the field of view with the parameter rate, right? You can see that here in the regular convolution, the um, uh, field of view is three, but in here is five because uh, the context here is larger. If you increase the rate, then you can increase the number of zeros in between. You can increase how sparse is this uh, matrix or the, the pixels that you get actually. And you can increase the field of view uh, while you're having the same number of parameters and the same amount of computation, right? I think you still need a little bit more of computation because you need to um, sample the, the pixels from the image in a different way. But uh, you perform the same number of multiplications and, and sums. So you save computation actually. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, so the second method that they propose is the use of a true spatial parameter pooling. <clears throat> um, in some architectures that I've seen, uh, what they do is typically they have uh, stack convolutions, right? So convolution, convolution, convolution. And then at some point they have a block that has convolutions in parallel. Then they concatenate the output and then they do convolution, convolution and so on. One example of these architectures is Inception, and yeah, also Exception actually, the one we were talking last month. This is one of the blocks of Inception, 
And here you can see that uh, the input is here. Then there are four branches. In each branch, we have different convolutions with different parameters. And at the end, uh, the feature maps uh, resulting from the convolutions, they are concatenated. Notice that for each branch, you can have different field of views, right? In this one, we have a field of view of one because um, we have a one by one convolution. In this one, we have a filter view of three, and this one three, and this one five, because we have true stack convolution. So the idea of a true spatial parameter pooling is to do the same or to have the same field of view, but using um, the delayed convolutions, right? And this is what they do. So they also have four branches, and in each branch, they only put one convolution, so they save computations. And then they just change the parameter rate, right? So they just change how wide this context is, basically. So it's it's a very simple idea, and it seems to work uh, quite well. So <laughs> then the third um, method is conditional random fields, and this is quite deep. Um, so I'm not gonna go into details because yeah, this this would would take probably a very long time. Plus I'm not an expert and I don't know too much to be honest about conditional random fields. So I will just explain the basic to understand what's happening in, in deep love ritual. <clears throat> conditional random fields are basically uh, probabilistic models and they treat the image as a graph. And this idea is not new at all. Uh, the very old segmentation methods, they, they treat images as, as graph, like this graph cuts algorithm that it's quite old already. But what was done before typically was to use a short range or locally connected CRFs, right? So if you have one pixel here, for example, you assume that the surrounding pixels, the neighbor pixels, they influence this pixel over here, which makes sense, right? Because if you have one pixel, it is very likely that its class is gonna be the same class as the neighbor. So that's, it, it kind of makes sense, right? But what they do in the in Deep Love V2 is that they use a fully connected CRFs. So instead of assuming that each voxel is, or each pixel is connected to the neighbors, in here they make a connection. Uh, so they connect basically one pixel to all the other pixels, right? So that's why it's called fully connected because it is connected to all of them, right? So you can imagine this is much, much, much more computationally uh, expensive than the other one, right? This is the energy function that um, they minimize and it has two terms. The first one corresponds to the CNN. So this can be anything basically. It, it can be uh, cross entropy, for example, or it can be dice loss. So they base in this part, basically they minimize the error of the convolutional neural network. I don't remember in the paper actually if, if they mentioned which loss function they use. <coughs> But the, um, the second term over here is the one that corresponds to the, um, to the relation between pixels and the conditional random field. So I'm gonna try to explain a little bit more in detail. So if we look in detail, you can see it's iterating over all of the pixels and uh, this is the formula. So it has two parts. The first part is um, uh, this mu function. And then we have this other big term over here. The mu function is basically like a switch or like an interrupter. Right? Um, you can see that um, it, 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 it's, it's one if the labels are different and if the labels are the same, then it is zero. So if the labels are different, then this other term over here is activated. So there is only a penalty if the labels are different. Uh, this term over here, we can see uh, P, which is uh, the coordinates of the pixels, and I, which are the intensities. Then we also have sigma, which is just a, a hyperparameter of the Gaussian. But yeah, it's just these are just the distance, right? So let's try to understand a little bit more what how this behaves. Uh, these are distances. The thing in, uh, I surrounded here in pink. These are distances. We can see this is the norm. So this is always going to be positive. If we look at the bigger term, we can see it have minus over here. So this is always going to be negative. And therefore this is going to correspond to the negative part of the exponential function. 
Now let's try to uh, imagine yeah, what happens with a, with a real example. So we have this plane over here and we have two pixels. We are comparing these two pixels. Uh, one of them is in the sky. The other one is very close, is on the plane. I don't know if you can see it because the pixel here is quite large, but it's on the plane and um, the intensities are similar because the plane is blue and then the, because of the sunlight, uh, yeah, it makes it similar to the sky. So we have a small distance here uh, between the pixels and intensities are very similar. So the distance is very small. This is gonna yield small negative values which corresponds to a large penalty. But uh, remember that such penalty is only applied if labels are different. Okay. Another example, we have these pixels that are very far from each other. Notice again that they are from two different classes. The intensity values are also very different because uh, this is in the behind the plane, not behind, like under the plane, which uh, there is a shadow. So intensities are very different, as I've said. This corresponds to large negative values, which uh, are um, basically a small penalty. Uh, sorry, and if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Um, if you have two pixels that are very far and are very different, you don't want this pixel to be affected too much or influenced too much by this pixel that is very far. On the other hand, if you have two pixels that are very close, it makes sense that uh, they have some influence, right? Because maybe there is a border uh, in there. So yeah, that's that's the the general idea of conditional random fields, I think. Then the optimization, it's something I, I will not explain here. I also don't, <laughs> don't really uh, understand in detail, but later I will provide some materials if you're interested in, in learning more about, about conditional random fields. <coughs> Then I will just mention the conclusion of some of the experiments that they perform in the paper. One of them is about the learning rate policy. So basically they um, take the learning rate and they multiply it by this formula over here, which I think I've seen somewhere else. So this is, uh, I think this is not rare. So this uh, policy is better or produces better results than decreasing the learning rate with a fixed step size. Then they also try different field of views in the um, ASPP module and the larger, the better. That's uh, their conclusion. They try two ar architectures, uh, ResNet and VDG and ResNet provided better results. Then CRFs, uh, sorry, CRFs also provided better results than not using the CRFs. And of course this makes sense if you look at the probabilistic map that comes from the network because as I've said, it's quite different from the ground truth. So CRFs are quite uh, important here. The funny thing is that in Deep Lab V3, they don't use CRFs anymore. So this is uh, used only in, in this one and also in Deep Lab V1, I think. So yes, let me actually show the code. That, uh, it's gonna be very simple. Um, basically here, I just want to, I just want to show uh, how you can use delayed convolutions, uh, which is just basically one parameter of, of the convolution uh, function in, in PyTorch. I guess in, uh, what is it? In TensorFlow is also very similar. I haven't checked it, but I'm pretty sure it's quite similar nowadays. But yeah, um, so first here I have my imports. I read the image over here. And actually let me go back here. So I'm gonna try to replicate this, right? So I'm gonna replicate this part over here. So I have two um, branches, right? In each of the branches, I have two convolutions. Here I have a regular convolution. Here I have a, convolu a delayed convolution. So uh, this is the first convolution. It's just a regular one. So kernel size is one. Dilation is one. This is the rate that I was talking before. Uh, by default is one. So that's the, the normal convolution. Stride is one, padding is three. And then this is the other convolution, the deleted one. You can see here, deletion is equals to two. And note that the padding is different. In here, padding is equal six, in here is three. Uh, this is of course a very small implementation detail, but I think this is one of those things that if you want to implement it yourself, you know, you will be maybe wasting one hour wondering why the output size is not the same as the input. Uh, and it's because you have to also set the padding, right? I think I spent some minutes trying to figure out why 
didn't work. But yeah, uh, anyway, you can see that is as simple as adding this uh, dilation equals to the rate that you want to use. And then it uses uh, delayed convolution. So it's as simple as that. Right in here, I just uh, use the same weights for both convolutions. And then in here, I do the three steps that are defined here. So downsampling, convolution, and upsampling. So I do the downsampling, convolution, and upsampling. And this is the other one, the other branch over here. It's just using <coughs> the convolution. <coughs> so yeah, just convolution, and that's it. Right, then I plot it here. And again, I'm not sure if you can see uh, this on detail, but you can see that this part over here is more higher resolution than, than the regular kernel, uh, the regular convolution uh, over here. So yes, uh, this code will be shared in the repository of, uh, of MLT init, by the way. And basically that's uh, it for the presentation itself. I just wanted to mention a couple of more things. Uh, the original ideas of this paper are quite old. The paper is from 2017 and uh, delayed convolutions are what, like uh, 30 years old already. CRFs are 20 years uh, old. And these are based on Markov random fields which are also very old. And then this ASPP is also kind of old already. So yeah, you can see that sometimes to make a nice paper, you just, I think it's a good idea to look back uh, in the literature and, and get some inspiration. Uh, you don't need to, you know, read too many papers from the last uh, conference. Sometimes good ideas are uh, old and maybe some things could not be implemented because of the computational cost, but nowadays it's easier. And then, yeah, if you want to learn more about conditional random fields, here I left some materials. This is the original work. I haven't read it, so I don't know if it's uh, very friendly to read. I guess it depends on your level. Uh, this is a very nice introduction that I read a couple of times. It's written by, uh, I think it's Charles Sutton, which I think also wrote the book of um, reinform reinforcement learning, which is quite famous. And then if you want to learn about probabilistic map models, uh, you have a Coursera course. I think there are four courses here in the, under this uh, course. So yeah, it's, it's quite nice. I took some of those classes and, and yeah, it covers things from the very beginning. So I think it's very uh, nice. It's a very nice resource. And basically that's it uh, about my presentation. I will uh, stop sharing for now. Um, I think it's okay you, you keep sharing. And thank you, thank you very much, Miguel, on, on your presentation. I also very much like what you said at the end of, of uh, this talk that uh, one does not necessarily need to always be like on top of things. You, you Definitely you'll be stressed out, but uh, there's really a, a merit and benefit to to just seeing what has been done like ages ago. And maybe by that time, they, they just didn't have the technology. They didn't have the computing resources by that time. But if you understand the, the fundamentals and it it's, can be really powerful um, in our current uh, time. So yeah, I think that's a good message to, to share with everyone.